before we introduce ourselves, let me just uh, have a little of uh, an interaction with, with you guys to see um, how much you know about mobile or um, and whether our presentation will be useful for you guys or not. Maybe it hopefully will present something new to you guys. So um, if everybody could just uh, raise your hand. So everybody, hands up. Um, now, if you've tested mobile before or if you're participated in software development that has to do with native mobile applications, I'm talking about mobile web, just native mobile applications, so iOS and Android, Blackberry, uh, Windows, uh, then please, uh, if you have not done that, if you have not done any of that, put your hand down. All right, we still have a few people that have done mobile testing or mobile development. Uh, so if you've been doing that for maybe two or three months, if you're just starting up, put your hand down. All right, we still have a few people, so um, maybe what, 15, 20 people? Okay, so those are you, 15, 20 people with your hands still up. Um, this will might look like a reflection of what you guys are going through. You can put your hand out now. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it will hopefully um, give you some comfort in that what you're doing, what the difficulties you're experiencing, the things that we're also experiencing, and you're not alone in this, right? Um, and hopefully you'll learn something new that, from the things that we are doing as well. For everybody else that put your hand down uh, throughout that little exercise, um, there's going to be a lot of information here. We have a lot of things to cover. Um, but we hope that it will be enough that uh, you guys get an idea of how mobile might be different from what you're doing right now. If your company is thinking about doing mobile, or if your company is thinking about, or you yourself, thinking about trying something with mobile, you know where to start. Right? Uh, and the beginning is hard, it's going to be difficult, like we're going to talk about uh, in the future, but um, hopefully you'll have some initial tools to get you to get you And just because the title of the conference is uh, related to automation and to code, not to code, um, we're going to talk a little bit about automation and mobile as well, and how that might be a little different from, from other industries. All right. so. Um, we're going to start with uh, introducing ourselves, uh, the topic. We're going to go into a little bit of uh, history and background information on not just software, but hardware and how that really, uh, I guess, drives us into mobile and how mobile might be different from other industries because of the combination of software and hardware. And then we're going to talk to, uh, about a couple of things that uh, uh, relate to Aja, that are part of the Aja manifest, and that might have very specific applications into mobile. Um, that might be unique ways of doing things mobile, or might need to be adjusted slightly so that they can work on the mobile um, industry. Uh, we're going to touch on automation, and then we're going to have some uh, time for summary and then question and answers from, from, from you guys. So, um, all right. Let's start with the introduction. So, my name is Julio Perez. I've been working on um, quality assurance for eight, nine years now, and doing mobile for about Six years, so pretty much since the first iPhone came out, I was involved in uh, one of the first applications. Um, and I've actually been working at a company called Akimi Software that some of you might have uh, uh, heard of. So this is what Akimi is. This is sort of the summary of what Akimi does. Uh, we do everything that has to do with mobile, iOS, Android, Blackberry, uh, Windows Phone. And like I said, we've been working with it since the beginning. We were one of the companies that had uh, the first, you know, couple of the first applications for the when the iPhone first launched. Um, and so if you ever have any need for Android or iOS development, uh, you know where to reach us. So that's me. I've been working with them for, for six, seven years now. And uh, mobile is what we do. So um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. OK. Uh, my name is Yvette Van Dopp. And um, I've been in software QA. I'm going to hide here behind the, uh, the podium. Um, I've been in software QA for um, about 15 years now. Uh, started doing testing on client server based architectures. Uh, the last five years, I've been doing mobile testing. Um, I think, in terms of agile, I don't believe that any uh, company that I've worked for has really adopted Agile in any sort of true form. I mean, people like to say, oh, we're doing modified Agile, or we're doing fragile, or all these different terms. But I think that in terms of uh, mindset, um, when I'm 
when I'm doing my job as a QA lead, I, I try to do it in an agile way, but um, none of the software teams I've been working on have really been um, agile per se. So yeah, it's been mobile for the last five or so years. So uh, that's it for introductions. Now I'm going to start talking about a bit about the evolution of, uh, of hardware and software. Now, this is all to get to, uh, to understand going mobile. So um, in order to be able to understand how we're going to go mobile and what it means, uh, we're going to look at a bit about the history of hardware and software just really quick. So um, when we think of software app development, it takes me back to uh, desktop and personal computers, PCs. So uh, back when, um, I don't know, I remember my dad brought home a TRS-80 and that was so cool and then there was Commodore 64 and then oh my goodness this is a 386 look how fast this thing is <laughs> these were desktop computers and PCs and then along came what I guess would be considered like the first form of mobile devices it was a laptop right so all of a sudden you're not chained to your desk when you're on a computer you can go into meetings uh, you can go around your house, you can go to a coffee shop, though I don't think we did that back then. Um, and then I think what came after that was sort of uh, more of what we consider mobile devices today, but they were application specific. So we had iPods to listen to our music. We had PDAs to uh, organize our lives. And then Blackberry came out with this amazing thing where you could actually read your email when you're walking, when you're walking down the street. And you could also, you know, talk to other people with mobile, uh, with Blackberries, and you could still organize your life and do all that. But it wasn't until uh, the smartphone came around where we saw what we consider today to be mobile software app development. So with the smartphone came this ability to start developing apps for uh, the mobile ecosystem. And then, of course, now we're into uh, wearables as well. Like, not only do we want to hold our, uh, our lives in our hands, but we want to wear them. We want to be able to access them um, quickly, easily, and on our bodies. So all of this hardware, like the evolution of all this hardware, has sort of, every, every time the, the hardware gets smaller and smaller, it kind of adds complexity to, to the testing and to the software, to software development. The software of it. So originally, when we uh, started on those desktop computers, uh, software, uh, even though we called it software, it was actually hardware too, right? It came in a box, it came on a disc of some sort, floppy, CD, and um, the actual development of the software was, uh, you had to go in stages, right? So you needed to have um, a, a release process and you release software and there was a big cost associated with releasing software and um, and if you had a bug in that software there was a big cost to actually fixing a bug because you'd have to do another release or you'd have to do a patch. Um, once the internet came around and people realized oh you don't actually need to release boxes of software um, we realized that not only could you actually uh, download software off the internet, but you can upload changes to your web-based applications instantaneously. So um, we started to, to go from having hard deadlines where you have to do app releases to a more continuous process where you could be uploading, you know, I mean, some companies nowadays, they upload daily to their production environments. Um, so, where mobile fits into this is that we've taken a bit of a step back. It's not as continuous to be able to release for mobile. Um, with App Store submissions, iOS, I mean all of you who have done mobile app um, development, uh, iOS, the App Store can take seven to ten days to review your app. So all of a sudden we're back to this mindset where, okay, uh, we can't just upload or release um, whenever we want to or whenever there's a critical issue, we have to still, we have to go back to planning and staging our, our releases. Um, so what does this mean that we've had to take the step back? Well, we've had to take a step back as, 
as app developers, but our users haven't, right? Their expectations are still really high. They want their software downloaded right away. When they're on the go, they don't care that they're only on a 3G network or anything like that. They, they don't care that the app that they're downloading is 50 meg, 100 meg. They want it right now. When they have that app, they want it to be responsive. They want it to, uh, to work the way it would when they're sitting behind their desks on a wired network or an internal Wi-Fi system. We want um, instant gratification. As well with uh, the quality of the product, we, they want to see that, um, that the apps not only have the same feature set as their web-based app, but that um, they work in a way that is it's consistent with mobile, being on the go. So with knowing all this about our users and the way we have to stage our releases and all that, where are mobile apps going? Well, we know that they're not going away. They're still growing. Like every, right now, we are um, in, this, in this period where there's new features coming on phones all the time. So good examples of this are Apple Pay and Google Wallet. We're trying to get rid of having a wallet and having it on our phone. So, you know, right now, I mean, I could forget my wallet today and I could still go to Starbucks and get a coffee. Um, there are also uh, the, the Apple Watch is coming out this week, and the big push for uh, the marketing for the watch was that you can, you can have better control of your health, or you can have more information about your health, right? You're wearing a watch. It can tell you your heart rate. It can monitor how much physical activity you're doing. Um, with banking, I mean, I know that recently, they might have not have done this recently, but I just noticed recently that my TD Canada Trust app can now let me take a picture of my checks to deposit them. I don't even have to go to a bank to deposit my check. And then uh, social media, of course. I mean, so I'm old, right? I, use, I, use, I do use Facebook as social media, but I mean, kids nowadays, they are doing so many different things with, uh, with social media. There's, well, there's Twitter. Um, something called Snapchat, and people want to be able to do stuff on their mobile phone and have it disappear, for reasons, well, we don't know why, but um, yeah, they're, they're for social media reasons, and then even uh, companies are leveraging off this because they're, do, like, they're doing things like, um, uh, so entertainment industry, right? Artists want to communicate more with their fans. So they want to do things like live stream from the phone if they're, if they're having like a jam session or concerts and stuff like that. So social media is definitely um, still growing and up and coming in mobile. And, uh, and then of course there's the wearables. So watches, glasses, anything like that. With all of these complications coming uh, with, uh, with mobile apps, companies are finding that it's becoming more and more expensive to develop them. So, of course, they want to be able to monetize off their mobile apps. Um, whether it's e-com and purchasing physical goods, so extending your reach of a retail outlet so that uh, not only are you online in the web, but you're online on your phone. So you can buy from virtually anywhere um, to digital goods and in-app purchases. And then, of course, the people can monetize from advertising within your app. And as well, I mean, any other way you can think of, um, people are creating ways to monetize off of their mobile apps. So that's sort of a bit about evolution. Um, now, in order to be agile when we're building these mobile apps, what exactly is it that we have to adapt to? What is changing so much in this mobile ecosystem? And how do we adapt to it? Agile teams are adaptable in, and able to cope with changes of any kind. Again, what exactly are we trying to change? Uh, what exactly are we trying to adapt to um, in mobile? 
So, um, of course, there's the changes of requirements and features that I think everyone deals with, right? Uh, with mobile, it can be a little more, um, there can be more change simply because the technology is always improving. All those things that I presented to you before, um, like Apple Pay, right? Say you have an app where you are, um, you're purchasing goods, and then all of a sudden Apple says, hey, we're coming out with this great new thing, Apple Pay. Well, you had your roadmap all laid out for the next year, and all of a sudden Apple comes out with Apple Pay, and you have to revisit how do we fit Apple Pay into our roadmap. So those are just the, like how changes in features and requirements can, uh, can make a need for adapting. But in addition to all these sort of requirements changes, some other changes are the development environments. A great example is Swift. All of a sudden, who, how long ago was that? A year, a bit, a year ago, a bit Apple idea. introduced a new language. And I've heard on more than one occasion companies say, uh, so we're going to start from scratch again and we're going to build using Swift. So, you know, that same roadmap, we're going to scratch that and we're going to start from the beginning again. Um, in addition to uh, stuff like languages changing, there's always uh, the compilers in, in the different uh, IDEs. Um, every time Xcode or Gradle has a change, the developers are forced to review code to make sure nothing broke, recompile code. Um, I think in, in, uh, in web-based applications, it's the same thing when you have a desktop OS that changes, you have to recompile and figure out if anything broke in your apps, but, um, or maybe not web apps, but desktop apps. Um, but I think the difference in mobile is that uh, things like Apple, they usually have a grace period. So after they do an OS release, they have a grace period of 30 days, 60 days, where um, you can work out all your kinks on the new OS, and then if your app does not compile on that new OS, they will reject you. So you can't leave it. You have to change everything you're doing to make sure that your app will compile and work in the latest OS, or you'll be rejected. So not only does this affect, I mean, you, you know, the features that you've been building out, but now you've got to change if you have any continuous integration platforms, you're going to have to change all that. If you have any automation done, you're going to have to change all that as well. Platform specific requirements and expectations. So there's kind of two sides to this. There's the idea that every platform has its guidelines and those guidelines are always changing. So anytime the guidelines change, you have to make sure your app meets those guidelines. Um, a good example of this is when, um, when the Apple App Store first started, I mean, they had less guidelines, right? And I think you were able to upload many different kinds of apps to the, to the App Store. Um, more recently, though, they, ha they have so many apps in the App Store now. And one of the guidelines actually says that uh, the addition of Duplicate apps is a rejectionable offense. You, you can be rejected because you are producing an app that's already on the market. And they actually put in there, we do not need another fart app. <laughs> <laughs> um, another part of platform specific requirements and expectations is that, um, well, there's two platforms, right? So, uh, well, there's, yeah, there's more than two platforms, but typically people now, they're developing for two platforms, iOS and Android. Each of those platforms has different um, expectations, they have different user experiences, um, and even the technology is different, right? On, um, on an iPhone, you have one home button here. On an Android device, you could have some hardware buttons for going back, for menus, that sort of thing. So. Um, when you're testing or when you're producing apps for both platforms, you have to, make, you have to consider these things. And then at the same time, the uh, business stakeholders, um, everybody else, they want to make sure that your apps actually are doing the same thing, right? So functionally, the apps have to be the same, but you have to consider that you're developing for two separate platforms. So every time something new, someone's calling me. So, <laughs> so, um, yeah, every time uh, 
you have any sort of changes, you have to consider you have two platforms. Different feature sets for different OS versions. This is kind of uh, similar to being backwards compatible, right? You get a new OS version, uh, you have to make sure that everything in your old OS version works. Um, but there are a little bit different nuances here. So um, an example of this is push notifications. Before iOS 7, push notifications were, um, they were implemented in a certain way. After iOS 7, things were done a little differently. I'm not gonna get into the technical details of all of it, but um, so all of a sudden you have to revisit push notifications to make sure that, uh, that for iOS 7, your pushes are working the way they're supposed to be. And if they're not, then something else you have to add to your roadmap, right? How do we fix push notifications? Uh, newsstand like, uh, is another good example of that. Before uh, Newsstand, magazine subscriptions, everyone was handling them on their own. Apple came out with Newsstand and they were gonna handle magazine subscriptions for you. Well, for people on devices that were older that didn't have Newsstand, you, um, after the release, you'd still have to support people who were still using older devices, older OSs, in addition, you'd also have to support newsstand. So, when we look at iOS, it's, uh, it's not so bad for backwards compatibility and having to test on all the different OSs, different feature sets, because a lot of people actually, they adopt um, uh, the upgrades in OSs quite readily. And also Apple, because they kind of have the monopoly on it, they have full control of the devices so they can enforce upgrades and, uh, and they'll provide the support for, um, for upgrading the OS as well. Um, Android is a little different. So many different releases and it, you can see the distribution and breakdown of, uh, of the popularity of the different um, OS versions, right? Like a lot of people now are still sitting at Jelly Bean, which is many iterations ago. But um, KitKat, that number is a lot bigger now than what it was six months ago. And what we don't see here is how quickly are people adopting Lollipop, right? So how much testing, do you still want to focus testing on Jelly Bean in your next sprint or your next iteration? Or are you gonna slowly start uh, weaning off of Jelly Bean and doing more lollipop testing? This doesn't even take into account all the different flavors. So there are tons of devices for Android and uh, the hardware manufacturers can customize the OS to meet the needs of their devices. So what Android comes out with is sort of the vanilla flavored OS, but depending on what device you have, uh, you might have to take into consideration different flavors of this OS. So we've talked about um, those, the first three um, changes. Another change is the multiple devices. So don't even get me started on devices. Um, this is sort of compared to, uh, for web-based testing, browsers, right? You can have many different browsers, Windows, Macs, that sort of thing, but it's kind of like it's on steroids because there's just so many different devices. So Android is, is kind of, it's worse for this. So we've had more challenges trying to figure out what devices we're gonna test on Android because um, while they have nearly no rules for allowing apps in the App Store, they actually have tons of devices as well. So what tons of devices means is that tons, there are tons of different screen resolutions, right? And how do you know what to test on? Um, the other thing about, um, about Android devices is that a company like Samsung, right? They're not looking at this from a, a standpoint of, oh, we want to minimize the amount of screen sizes we have out there. Actually, they want to maximize the number of screen sizes they have out there. They, they want as much out there as possible, so they just throw everything out on the market and then they see what sticks. Well, how do we know what, what to test? 
Apple is a little better at this. So the way they've re re um, released screen sizes so that it's, it's a little bit friendlier for application developers is that all their screen sizes are proportional. So you have um, 1x, 2x, 3x for those of you who have done iOS app development. And it's a little easier to be able to, uh, to narrow down the number of devices that you're testing on in order to um, meet the full breadth of, of the different UI sizes, screen sizes. So back to that uh, original question. How can we be adaptable in this mobile ecosystem? Well, Apple will recommend to us um, target the latest and greatest OS, follow its guidelines, and let the OS do the work for you. Right? So an example of this is, uh, is actually UI layout. Um, Apple has always had their developer guidelines for how a UI is supposed to be laid out on the screen. More recently, they introduced something called auto layout. And what auto layout is supposed to help with is if you have, uh, if you're building a universal app for all those, the different devices, iPad, iPad mini, iPhone, um, if you use auto layout, your screen sizes should, should adapt to, um, to whatever device you're on. Sorry, your UI should adapt to whatever device you are. So um, if you did follow these Apple Dev guidelines for how to build a UI, then when auto layout comes out and you're using it, then your UIs all should just work. Right? Now, of course, you know, we don't rely on that. We still do our testing. But I think it just requires a little more, uh, a, a lot less um, iterative work to get your, your UIs to, to work well on the different devices. Android, I think because they, are, um, they have so many more devices and so many more different screen sizes, they recommend that you look at the market that your app is in and you decide what your target market is and what your target devices are and then that's where you start testing. Um, so a good example of this is um, uh, one of the companies we were working with, they had uh, they were building an app that they were targeting to moms. And, um, and I can say this because I'm a mom. So as, as a mom, you don't always get the latest and greatest device. So before I got this phone for Christmas, I was, whole, um, I was using an iPhone 4S, right? And I wasn't upgrading to iOS 7 because everyone said that once you go up to iOS 7, your 4S's will slow right down. So I was using iOS 6 on an iPhone 4S. And um, so, if your target market is moms who don't necessarily get the latest and greatest, right? They get the hand-me-downs from their kids. <laughs> then you want to make sure that your apps work on, on these older phones, right? You might even want to target your testing on the older phones. But Android will say, if in doubt, go with the latest and greatest, and then use their vanilla flavor of the OS. So as an aside to this, this is sort of, um, we're saying that in order to be adaptable, know the guidelines, right? Know, know your platforms and the way they want you to develop your apps and develop them, develop them that way. But in the same way that when you're building a house, you always have like your architect and your engineer that are, you know, the architect wants to do the fanciest, most elaborate things and the engineer just wants to cut it right down to what is absolutely necessary. Um, it's the same with UI, UX, your designers, and then your software engineers, right? The, the UI, UX people just want it to look really great and be really flashy and do amazing things. And then the software, it's up to the software engineers to say, hey, that's going to come at a really big cost. So software engineers and QA, right? To say that if we do that, that's a custom control. Every time the platform changes something, you could be looking at a lot of work in, uh, in making this custom control work. So that's it for adaptability. All right, so uh, we talked about uh, the evolution of hardware and software. Um, 
Okay, so, go ahead. Okay. 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 Very good. Um, then we talked about um, how we adapt into mobile, how adapting uh, the way agile uh, groups are supposed to adapt to um, changes, how we adapt into mobile. And now we can talk a little bit about uh, continuous integration and delivery. And then uh, what that means mobile and how that might change uh, in a mobile team compared to um, web. Is the guys still there? Um, so, the rapid iterative delivery of working software is important as it is the best way to measure progress. That is true in mobile as well. Um, how is that true? Well, I have a couple of examples here just from um, you know, the Apple App Store. These are two of the top five most popular applications in the store. Um, now, something interesting that you can notice see, apart from the fact that they're a well known application, there's Facebook and there's you know, YouTube is that if you look at the ratings, they have two and a half stars and three stars out of five. And on the other side, you see that uh, they have more one star ratings than five star ratings. So if these are so popular applications and most people actually use them on a daily basis, probably, why do they have the rating? Um, it's a bad rating and is that a reflection of you know, their approach to delivering software or is it something else? Uh, and if it is a reflection of how they deliver software, what can we do about it or how can we address that. Um, so one of the reviews that YouTube has is this. The basic idea of this review is I can't even play videos on your application. So if you see something like this on your reviews, because as testers, we usually, um, you know, the next couple of days, three days, a week after I release, we look at the app store, we constantly check to see what people say about our app, because more often than not, the comments that they post are negative comments, right? You won't necessarily say, this is great, because if it's working fine, you won't even notice that it's actually working because it's helping you do your thing. Um, so we usually check this to see what people are saying, to see if we miss certain bugs, to see if there's something we need to fix. So um, YouTube should have been able to react to this relatively quickly and figure out if there is a problem or if there is some something specific to this person. Now this is still, after about maybe three weeks, four weeks, uh, one of the first five reviews that YouTube has in there. Um, that it could mean that they fixed the problem and the user never went back to update it, which is also very common. Um, but it begs the question as to what other people think when they try to download your application. I mean, nowadays, the internet has made things very easy for us to uh, you know, when we go to a restaurant, when we go to a hotel, when we try to buy a new product, uh, download a new application, the first thing we usually do is check the reviews for it, uh, right? And it doesn't really matter as much whether that person actually, you know, how credible that person is. Maybe we actually are, some of us, making the effort to try to find more credible sources. But still, if the first two or three reviews that we see are something like this, maybe we're not going to... Um, start using the application. Now, this is one of the reviews on Facebook, and it's a bit verbose, but the idea is that this person is defending Facebook, right? It's saying, look guys, this app is meant to do this, and it does that well. Stop complaining about why we have another Facebook app, why we separated this from the main Facebook app, and let's just use it. That person gave Facebook five stars. But still, that's just one out of five reviews that most of them, most of their reviews were bad. Why do I need another application? Why do I need to separate? Facebook Messenger for Facebook itself. So it comes down to Facebook whether they know uh, their market, um, whether they underestimate or overestimate the number of people that actually use Messenger, how they use it, and how that will interact with the application. Um, this is still one of the top, uh, the reviews that are at the top, uh, the first reviews that you can read on, on the uh, App Store. So it means that. One of the ways that uh, I guess we should clarify is that after whenever a new version comes out, uh, reviews and ratings get pushed back to a slightly different area of the app, app store. So you can see reviews and ratings for the current app or for the overall lifetime of the product. So as long as there isn't another version, this will stay there until Facebook or YouTube release a new version of it. Um, so. Um, a good question to ask, especially now with you know, celebrities and all the scandals that come out of it, is any type of publicity is good publicity. Is it really? Um, well, <coughs> let's think about what a star really means, right? Uh, these app stores have a 
five star review system, but with each star, they are really subdivided into three components as far as rating goes. And they really only give you a no star, half star, or a full star. So a point one difference on the rating, it makes a lot of difference. You could have four star up, or you can have four and a half star up. And that half could make a difference for somebody that's just comparing between two competing applications. Um, is changing in the rate is always the same? Not necessarily. Sometimes you know, people just post um, a rating for, because you know, that's the thing they think they're in between four and five, so I'll give it a four. Uh, that's OK. Um, but if it is larger than 1%, then maybe you got something wrong. Maybe you think about your market in the correct way. Maybe the new feature that you pushed out, you should have done some different type of testing before you push it out to the global market. So we're going to talk about some of the um, solutions for that problem, some of the ways that we can address this issue. So this is sort of like the, uh, the problems that we face and why we need uh, uh, to think about continuous integration and delivery. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, the roadblocks that we find when we try to do that in mobile. Right? Why is it? It might be more difficult that you might have experience in other industries. So like Yvette was talking about the App Store rules and regulations, it turns out that for iOS there are about 29 sections on the document that describe the rules and regulations, and it's actually a 5,000 word document. Uh, and they can fail you for any one of those reasons. Now, I have an example of here on one of the rules, and it says apps must comply with all terms and conditions explaining the Apple iOS human interface guidance. The problem is that that is another document. There's at least another 5,000 words too. Right? It's not just words, it's actually guidelines as to how icons are supposed to be drawn, how to, uh, which fonts you're supposed to use, or not supposed to use, colors, and all this. Some of these are suggestions. Um, nevertheless, they might choose to reject it because you're doing something not quite in part with the plan. Um, Android has a similar uh, guideline. They're less uh, known than iOS, just because they are not as strict with the type of application that I approve. Nevertheless, they are still there. Um, and it's a good idea for testers that are doing Android development or for developers that are doing Android development to really read through this. It might answer a few of the questions that I have. Uh, one of the things that we notice often in Android applications is the confusion between the up and the back button. Uh, pretty much every app either has a different interpretation of what those buttons should do. But um, there's actually, there are actually rules that Google describes as to how those buttons should use. And you really need to have a good reason to deviate out those rules. For what is that because they don't really have a lot of control over it, because of the way they chose to accept applications or not, people are not following those rules. Uh, in the case of Apple, they're more strict about it. They have the seven days waiting time. So that makes it a lot more difficult. Um, so the other blocker is that, the review periods. Right? Uh, like Yvette was saying, seven to 10 days for regular person or a regular developer or for any developer, uh, that's what we're looking at before an application can be approved and be readily available to the public. So the moment a bad review comes out, you can expect another two weeks of people using the bad application. Um, there's, uh, there's some lucky uh, companies out there that Apple cares about and then that they bring a lot to their ecosystem. So there's uh, something called expedited releases for them. So um, that reduces the waiting time to 24 hours. There's still a waiting time. And now they need to call their friend for a favor in Apple that says, hey, can you approve this thing? And, but it's still a 24-hour waiting period. And there's still no guarantee that they will actually get it third because they still do some checking on it. Uh, and that's only for really special circumstances. The really special companies can able to do that. Um, and even when they, um, more recently in iOS 8, when they introduced the idea of beta testing um, to help you or help us do some of these things, they still have a waiting period for it. You cannot just choose to distribute your, 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 your uh, product to, um, to the general public, even if it's not limited form. They still want to have control over it. So Apple has a lot of control over it, and that's a big roadblock uh, when it comes to continuous integration and continuous delivery. Um, there are also security concerns that we have. Um, if you're working on a product that is secret, uh, for Android, as soon as you make that application, as soon as you sign that application, the application gets out there, anybody can install the application, you lose control over it. Sure, there are ways that you can block it on your server side, like you do for web pages and so on, but it is out there. iOS, they put a lot more emphasis on being careful with what you sign, who you allow it, who, which devices are allowed to install the application, and so on. And that, again, uh, if we're trying to do this in a more, uh, in a faster way, 
quicker approach, that limits how quickly we can get a product to the right people. Um, if I want to give an application to a vet, first I need to check that I have the right permissions for a vet to use my application. Uh, and it's not just that she's able to access the web services that I have, which I have full control over it because they're mine. It's also that Apple has authorized vet and vet's devices to make use of my application. Um, and this comes to complex distribution systems. Um, it's not just click, download, and install. In some cases, it might be, or it might look like it. But um, companies like Hockey App, App Ferry, Test Flight, um, they're making their money in facilitating how we distribute applications to people. Um, they have all sorts of uh, instructional guidelines on how we can sign things more easily or authorize people more easily and even control it. They give us all that infrastructure so that we can just focus on building the application. Uh, but again, that's a third party system now you need to deal with that is outside of your uh, unit of work that you have control over. It's another thing that you need to deal with. So what are some of the solutions and one car workarounds that we have um, tried in our company or with our customers and they have worked and uh, um, why they're important? So the first one is internal distribution is the new delivery, especially if you're a product company. Don't really, um, well, you might consider that releasing the application to the public is a good idea, but if you are releasing an application every day internally, why don't you just give it to the rest of your company to try it out? I mean, a good analogy would be on a restaurant. Uh, you, if you go to a restaurant, you expect the service to know, uh, to have certain level of knowledge about the food that they serve, the, the wines or the pairing of, of the drinks with the, the dishes and why they're doing certain things. What would taste better than, than another dish or have some preference to them, uh, about the food that they are serving. So the same way if you are a product company and you uh, work magazines, you expect people to sort of read your magazine at some point. If they are not reading your magazine, then what are they reading a competitor's magazine? It doesn't sound like um, such a good idea. So use your internal network as a way of trying out your product. Um, new features behind toggles. So this is another way of getting developers to push code faster to uh, the application. And uh, as long as you can agree on a way that you can block that from going out to uh, production or being accessible to the public and only being accessible for testers, that is a good way of doing things. Now, um, I added that note with moderation. That is because uh, you need to be careful as to what you allow reviewers, especially on Apple, to see or not to see. Apple requires you to tell them what has changed. And if you didn't include a particular feature as a change or as a new thing and they didn't get to test it, to test it or to review it in a way, you might get in trouble with them as well. So um, those are useful, especially for testing, but uh, you just need to be careful as to, as to um, how you roll them out. Uh, stage rollouts whenever possible. Um, this is particularly good with Google. Google has this option where uh, once your application is ready for production, you might choose to only distribute it to a 10% of your user base. You give it to those 10 people, which are randomly, I believe they are randomly selected by Google out of the, all the people that have your application currently installed. Um, and then you can sit uh, and wait for those people to give some comments and to maybe give some feedback to you um, for maybe a couple days, a week. And after that, maybe you increase it to 25% and see uh, how the market now reacts before you can increase it to make it available to the entire, uh, to the entire user base. Um, Maybe within 10% you found that there are some significant issues that you need to fix. So you have the option of uh, doing some kind of rollout back to the previous version. And if, in the worst case, only 10% of your user base was actually affected by it. It's better than having you know, really bad reviews or really bad application for everybody that's intended to use it. Um, signing, provision, profile, certificates, uh, especially if you're a security conscious company or you're working on something uh, that is more private that you don't want the world to know yet. Um, it doesn't matter which method of distribution you are using. Um, you should have a look at some of these things. Might be too technical for this conversation, maybe too involved for this uh, presentation, but just know that um, you should consider security as part of your mobile application um, development and testing as well. Uh, versioning, app and data feeds. Uh, I'm pretty sure people do it on the web, people do it on the desktop, but just the idea that if I put out a new version of the application with a new feature, I need new um, server-side components to support it. You also don't want to um, sort of disturb people that are using the current version of the application. 
uh, and maintaining those things might be too difficult. Uh, so version is a good idea. Uh, depend on your servers as much as possible. The delay in the review of the mobile applications themselves make it difficult to push uh, features quickly. So if you can push some of that logic over to your server and make the application just more uh, reactive or more about displaying information that you have, um, or more dynamically um, you know, adjusting to what your server is giving, that might be a better solution if your product or your type of application can do that. Um, analytics and crash reporting is the case. Uh, yeah, so Google and Apple, they both say that whenever your application crashes and your device is plug your, your users plug their device to their computer, you, know, you as a developer get reports out of those crashes or certain behavior that the user might have done. The truth is that it's not as simple as, it, as that. And even when you do get crash reports, you don't have the context that you know, why was that crash generated. Um, very often the crash reports are useful, but very often they are not. They are only an indication that there is a problem. They don't really help you diagnose the problem. Um, so there are analytic tools, there are crash reporting tools to track the user uh, interaction with the software, not necessarily to know what they are doing so that you know, I can sell more product to them, but also to know which areas might be problematic in the application. Um, and the last one um, that not many companies, I think, do is in-app upgrade mechanisms, sort of like a kill switch. So as you go from version to version, uh, maybe you want to phase out older versions of your application, but you don't want to really rely on iOS or Android's on upgrade mechanisms. So you want to pop your users or tell your users, hey, there's a new version, upgrade now. Right? If they're an active user of your application, um, they will want to upgrade if you tell them that there's a new thing. So if you can showcase that somehow in your current version, you know, that there's an old new version with a more interesting thing, they might be more willing to, to upgrade than if Apple or Google just tells them that there is a new version. Maybe they don't care, maybe the current version is working fine for them. Um, uh, and a couple of, uh, I think I jumped that one. Let's see. I think this might be a more familiar slide to some people. So um, the first one is just a list of utilities that I found recently that make it really uh, uh, easy to deal with some of the um, Apple developer uh, tasks. So maintaining a list of devices that are um, allowed to use certain applications or updating profiles, updating certificates, things like that. It's a lot more handy when you can do it from Android or we can, you, you can do it as part of your uh, you know, continuous integration process rather than having to go to Apple's website every couple of days because somebody else bought a new device that I need to add now to my list. Uh, Gradle configuration files, if you're using Android, that is now the recommended way of building different versions of your application for distributing for different things. Um, so you might want to learn a little bit about that as well. And the last one, Jenkins has many plugins. Um, that seems to be now one of the most popular, if not the most popular, continuous integration um, mechanism in the building system. So yeah, it works well for mobile. There are a lot of plugins for Excel, for Android. So um, if you're already using that, that is great. So uh, that was continuous integration delivery. And the last thing is automation. Um, so just like on uh, desktop computers or web computers, there are different levels of automation that we can do in mobile application. I'm not going to focus on the unit test type of, 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 of tests or the integration type of tests. I'm also gonna focus, more going to focus on the UI um, type of testing, uh, simply because that is the part that might be uh, more unique up to mobile uh, in the mobile um, ecosystem and might, yeah, that you might actually find um, more difficult to get into or uh, getting used to it. So, um, to automate or not to automate, I believe that's the title of uh, the conference. Um, without getting too much into it, I think it depends. Right? Uh, I'm talking specifically about UI automation as well. Uh, it depends on how much you're willing to put into it, how much your team knows about it, how much your team is willing to learn about it. If you only have a limited amount of time and you don't really have the capacity to learn uh, a new method of automation, of the automation, then it's not going to work for you. Um, 
BDD and TDDD, yes, these are all useful things, and we'll see later on. I have a little example that we can do on how that type of techniques can be useful for ensuring that when we're building things, we're building in a way that will facilitate our automation if we're choosing to go in that way. Uh, and the testers have to code well, I think, we're ready that presentation and yeah it is useful to know something about it not necessarily code but to understand how the application works to make suggestions and as I go through the example you'll see why it is important that you know even the mobile application to know how the mobile application was built so that we can um, write more effective tests um, but after all that if you do decide to automate um, how do we go about it? so I'm gonna have uh, a couple of slices here giving you a little bit of background including what is out there, what tools you may use, and uh, what types of uh, UI automation um, testing frameworks there are. An overview of uh, how automation works and some of like, the general ideas of how these frameworks do things in mobile. Um, that will give you an idea of whether you want to go with framework A versus framework B. Um, common roadblocks that we find are uh, automated testing, and that's where you might get a little more technical, so hopefully I won't lose all of you. A couple of you might still run around. Uh, for that, and then some tips as to what we have found that works and uh, how we do things and how that might help you do something. So let's start with a little bracket. Um, so I started looking into automation in about 2010 for mobile devices. Uh, late 2009, early 2010, that was pretty early in, in, in the mobile uh, industry. And back then we had Device Anywhere, that was one of the first companies that I actually heard of that did professional automation work. And what they did is image comparison and test text recognition. Um, back then, it didn't work very well for me. Um, well, it just didn't work very well for me. Uh, but they are still around, and that's an option. If you like that kind of system with this more user interface, uh, a drag and drop type of situation, then that's still available to you. It's been around for a long time, so uh, they probably have improved by now. Uh, Monkey and Monkey run it. Interestingly enough, uh, Monkey is, well, when you think the word monkey, you think you know, monkey just running around in the jungle doing things. And that's exactly what that tool is. Uh, it's just a tool that helps you randomly tap things on an Android device. And that's really one of the early iterations of automation that Android came with. Uh, not a lot for you to do with, but more about just uh, let's see how much this application can withstand. That's actually still around, uh, believe it or not. So something more, um, I guess, known to uh, web development will be Selenium. And there are actually many frameworks I, uh, that are based on Selenium. Frank, Calabash, Robotim, all of these use the same idea that Selenium uses. Um, many of the commands that people use on the web are actually transferable over to mobile. Um, and that may or may not work for you. Uh, we'll see why uh, that's the case. Apple, around late 2010, introduced their own way of doing automation, which is called UI automation. They decided that uh, well, I guess the tagline was find bugs while you sleep. So the idea was you know, the developer, like individual independent developer writing their own application and alongside writing Java automation scripts that they can have running overnight while they are not coding. Um, how that translates to a bigger company with a QA team, uh, that's still debatable. Um, especially because they don't really have a lot of guidelines as to how you do things. They just give you, these are tools, this is a programming language, so you go uh, crazy and figure it out. Now, luckily for us, there are a couple of, uh, these are just two, I'm pretty sure there are more, but there is a TuneUp.js and a Mechanic.js libraries, which are people that have said, hey, I could take this tool that Apple is giving me and package it up and make it simpler for people to use more common words like assertions or scroll to element blah or test assert that we do this. Uh, so that's what these people have done. Um, there are other uh, companies that uh, have paid services for it, Monitox, Luminal Expression, they're all different levels of different languages, uh, different approaches to automation. Maybe they don't use Selenium, but uh, well, because they're paid, it makes it a little more difficult for us to figure out how they're actually doing the automation. Uh, and as uh, gonna, you're gonna see in the next slide, how that automation was done on the device was important for, for a team, and that really you know, was the deciding factor as to which tool we ended up using. And the last one is Appium. Um, I think if you're doing mobile, you've probably heard this in the last year or so. Uh, that's, I guess, the current most popular uh, automation tool. 
uh, and then we're going to talk about Appium as well. So Appium, uh, the big appeal for it is that it's multi-platform. You have one script that in theory will work with iOS and Android, but tweaking a few little things here and there. Um, no, from experience, I actually am using Appium on an application that is for both iOS and Android, and we actually have one script that is working for both applications. It's taking a lot of work, uh, and it's taking, um, it's not just QA that is doing the work, it's actually devs and QA that are working together to do all this work. Um, and having devs involved into the development process of the test scripts actually has helped uh, speed up the process of writing those scripts. But it works, it just takes a little getting used to it. Um, the other appeal from Appium is that it's multi-language. So if you know Java, you can write it in Java. If you know Ruby, you can write scripts in Ruby. If you know Cucumber or Aspect, you can write tests in that language as well. Um, and if there is a language that they don't currently support, but you are really fond of, hey, if you have some free time, you can actually just write your own uh, sort of plugin for Appium and use the language that you want to use. Um, their community is really great. Uh, one of the bigger issues that they had recently was the inclusion of iOS 8. Uh, Apple tweaked a few things on their own framework, and so Appium didn't work very well. Uh, but they were really quick at responding, or at least saying, look, I, we know there is a problem, we're trying to find uh, a way to fix it. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a really good community that they have. Uh, the other thing is based on Selenium, which makes it, um, makes the entry point into it a lot easier if you're a web development compared to something else. Uh, but it's not quite the way the other frameworks are based on Selenium. Um, and that's really what drove us to use Appium. Um, the reason why it's not quite like other tools is because they actually rely on the native tools that are provided to us by uh, the companies that support those operating systems. So they use Apple's tools and they use Google tools in the way that they are meant to be used. They just provide a nicer interface for us to interact with them. So um, this will help us differentiate the, uh, I guess, the main two versions of uh, automation frameworks that are and why it is important, why it was important for a team and why it might be important for you. Uh, so this is what I would consider like the ideal way of an automation framework to work. You have your scripts on one side, then you have your application on one side, and then somehow you are able to run your scripts on your application without modifying your application, without using any intermediary to help on that connection. You simply run your scripts, on your application. So now you're testing the exact same thing you're going to give to your um, users out in the wild, right? Now, what happens with most of, um, systems that are based on Selenium is that, uh, for example, Frank was one of them, that was one of the first ones that came with it. They have the scripts on that side and they have the app on this side, but before you can actually automate that application, uh, you need to Frankify your application. That's how they call it, which basically means that you need to include this tiny little file in your application. Uh, to give it a web server, the Selenium server. So now the Selenium server is living in your application, and our application is not necessarily the same thing that you are giving to the public. Uh, that was very important for our team because we have the idea we must test what the user is actually testing unless um, we can't do it or unless there is some other reason why we can do it. So that sort of steers away from that sort of framework. Uh, it meant that we had to add extra steps on top of what devs were generally doing, and it meant that before we submit an application to the store, we had to remove all of those extra pieces that we had. So that wasn't something that we wanted to do. Then the way Appium works is that they take the server and they put it in the middle. So it's outside of your application, it's sitting on your computer, your scripts talk to it, and the server is still talks to the application, <coughs> but we're not modifying the application. Um, and I think that's as close as we can get to this one without actually using the UI automation framework and having to learn those other tools. So if you want to write scripts in Java, that would be a good option if this is important for you. Um, now, let's talk about a practical example of it. And uh, hopefully, um, I won't take too long. Uh, but we'll see, and this is sort of like one example of why it could get a little complicated to do things on, on mobile. Uh, so this is a, a very simple application. The application simply displays your current, uh, the current time on different cities around the world. Right? So um, I wrote down three of the basic tests that you might consider doing on this application. 
Uh, do we have all of the cities that we expect? Are the cities in the correct order? And for a given city, do we have the right data? So that seems like the test that we call out of me. Uh, that we really need to test every time on a manually or inspection basis. We can probably give that to some tool to do it, right? So uh, let's talk about Android for a minute. Android tends to be that what you see on the screen is what you will see in your automation tool. So there will be absolutely no difference between this and that. That's good because you won't have any hidden artifacts on your automation. But the problem is that if this table has 429 items, looking at that picture in Android, I don't know that it actually has 429 items. I will have to scroll through all of those items and keep track of it myself to know that it actually has 429 items. So if this city is over here and then my swipe gesture throws the city out of the screen, now I lost track of what I was. I cannot count anymore. So my strategy for interacting with this application kind of switches a little bit. Right? Um, now that's Android. Let's talk about iOS. Well, iOS, it really depends on how your developers implement the application. So one way of implementing it is that, um, well, we're using a table. And we're not really very doing, a, doing a very efficient job at reusing uh, some of our UI elements. So we have this table that, although we're displaying seven elements, the table is 429 items. So we're actually holding those 429 items in memory. So your script can actually see it. I can actually count how many cells there are. Uh, and as I scroll up and down, you can imagine that the cells just spill out of the screen uh, one way or spill out of the screen the other way. Right? So that could be very handy for certain types of tests. Um, but what if your developers implemented it in a slightly different way? What if they are doing a technique of reusing the views, reusing the cells to try to reduce the memory consumption? Because after all, we're talking about better devices that have limited resources. Uh, so we need to be mindful of processing power and memory usage. So what happens is that we're no longer talking about seven, just seven of them, but we're not quite talking about 400 cells either. There might be a few extra cells that are there just to facilitate the scrolling of the user, but really the majority of them will be hidden at the top of the view. And they will have an origin of 0, 0, and a size of 0, 0. And only when you finally scroll through them, you will be able to see. So that might introduce some incorrect results on your automation because you don't quite know whether things are there or are not there. Um, and this is where TDD or BDD actually works because you can sit with the developer and see how you want to implement this or do we have this feature, how are we going to go about it? And then we can talk about it um, on a one-to-one -one basis to see how best we can structure our tests. Now, the other thing is I'm actually from Guatemala, so I'm using you know, Guatemala City right here. Um, we have two cells that represent two cities. Now, um, on web, I think we use generally IDs to refer to elements and to say click element with ID, blah, right? So we have the same sort of idea in, in, in the mobile industry. The problem is that um, you need to do more work to do that, to get that to work, right? Developers need to add those labels on purpose. Um, so if they don't do the work, I have no way of distinguishing what Mala from Vancouver. When I look at that in my automation tool, all I'm going to see is an empty label. I will have no way of saying which one is which one. I just know that there are two cells, right? So um, this is a way that they can actually implement uh, the labels. They could go crazy and add a label to every single element on the screen. And that may work. But the problem is that depending on how they do it, the out outermost label might obscure all of the other labels. So. We can't just say to developers, or developers can just go in and say, I'm going to add labels to absolutely every UI element, because who knows what QA we want to use, right? Again, back to the TDD sort of style, that if I lay down the test that I'm going to do, or if we describe the test that we're going to do, that will um, let us know which labels we actually need and which labels we don't need, right? Um, that is a way to, I guess, save developers time trying to figure out how to add labels to which things and really just adding the labels that we need as we need it. Uh, the other thing is that it's a lot easier to add these labels as you go than waiting for the end of the project to do it. Uh, or maybe even waiting for the end of the sprint, if that's when you're writing your automation scripts. By the time you get to it, it's probably going to be too late, and you're going to end up 
using techniques that are not maintainable for the future of your automation uh, framework. All right, so what you want to end up is something like this. Suddenly, I can now click on the label Vancouver, and I can see Vancouver. So I can easily identify the cell, and I have no longer a problem. Um, some of the other limitations, well, depending on what you're doing, you might be able to use your device or your simulator. Uh, some cases, you cannot use both of them. Some cases, you can only, you, you can use both of them, but you need to adjust your um, scripts in certain ways. For example, geolocation testing. If your app, say, gives uh, movie time schedules, depending on where the device is located, how are you going to test that if you're all sitting in Vancouver? Uh, you're not going to send your you know, employees to all around the country to figure out how that will work. So uh, both devices include certain utilities to help that, but if your automation framework wants to use it, it might be easier if we do it on the similar run of the device. Uh, swipes and other gestures, uh, they tend to require slightly different uh, methods when you want to work on the simulator of the device. And so um, if you're doing most of your automation testing on the device versus the simulator, you might want to lean more towards that than to the other. Um, and then the speed. Um, for some reason, I don't really understand why. Well, actually, I have an idea of why, uh, but it's still just a theory. Android seems to work a lot faster than iOS when you automated things. And then when it comes to simulators versus devices, um, sometimes your device might be faster than your simulator for iOS, sometimes it might not be. It really depends on what you're doing and which methods you're using. Maybe you're not using the right method for your automation. Uh, and then, as we know, uh, or as some of you that might, you, might do uh, UI automation know, um, speed and timing issues could make or break your UI automation framework. Um, and for all that, we have uh, third-party services such as SOS Labs, AppSock, TestDroid, Device Anywhere that they take your automation framework and then they give you a bunch of devices for you to test. Uh, one of the limitations that we have right now is that you can only do one device at a time. So Apple has a restriction where you can only plug one iPhone or one iPad and you can only run one test on one device. So if you have 100 tests, it's going to take you a long time to get through all of those but these other uh, companies give you the possibility of using more than one device at a time. Um, they have other things get in, get in the way of your automation testing, so alerts, typing methods that you, wear, that you use, uh, your wearables, again, how do we test now that watches have come out or glasses have come out, um, and there are all sorts of other features that come as part of mobile that will make your automation testing. Um, so, I think I already mentioned most of these ones, but just as a summary, um, it really is a, a development project on its own. And everything that we use on development, pro uh, development of a product, so actually writing code or production, should actually be used for automation testing as well. And uh, it really, uh, there needs to be a conversation between devs and QA to really understand what's needed for the product to be automated and for it to be useful. All right, so now we're just going to give a few closing remarks for the entire presentation to see where we are at. Okay, so I, I'm apologizing in advance. When Julio and I sat down to say, what are we going to talk about in mobile, we basically did a brain dump of everything we know in mobile, <laughs> and we just fed it all to you in an hour and 15 minutes, which was uh, way too much time to have all of you sitting here, and we have no time for Q&A. But just to wrap it up, what we essentially talked about in four points is that mo the mobile ecosystem is changing and it will continue to change. Uh, the apps are getting more complicating, uh, complicated and um, we have to, to adapt to it. Um, in order to adapt to these changes, what Apple and Android or Apple and Google recommend is that you know your platform's guidelines and you use the best practices and you also understand your target market. Um, also, uh, with Julio talking about continuous integration and delivery, there are many tools out there to facilitate uh, quick delivery of mobile apps while maintaining quality. So it's just getting to know everything that's out there. And then lastly, if you're going to automate, you've made that decision, great. Uh, how do you go about doing it? 
talk to Julio. <laughs> or call, call uh, give a TV a call. Um, I just have to say, uh, commend Lisa and Janet for their presentation, their keynote presentation, because they made it look so easy. This is actually really hard to stand up here and talk to a room full of people. So thank you all for being patient with us.